All right, next I have the pleasure of introducing Ken Shelton. He's a global keynote specialist and technology integration strategist, strategist for the EdTech team. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm glad that some of you didn't decide to leave. I just watched where there was this little exodus right now. Um, so I, I want to share with a couple of things with all of you right before I get started. Number one, I want to thank everyone who's organized this conference because this, this is a really unique experience for me. I, I grew up down the street and down the road in Culver City. I went to school here, go Bruins. Um, and I also spent four years out on that field right there playing football here. So I feel like I've almost come full circle uh, as far as my growth as, as, a, as an educator and as an adult and individual. So what I want to do with, with all of you over the course of the time that I have up here is number one, say thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you. And number two, I, I want to talk a little bit about data. And, and I noticed yesterday that both Jim and Pedro kind of touched on a little bit of my perspective uh, on data, and it's the dangers of data. I'm not going to say that data is bad, but it can be very dangerous on how we, how we use it, among many other things. So number one, oops, there we go. All right, so number one, what's the purpose of data in the first place? You know, it's a question that I've asked many of my colleagues that are CIOs and school districts and even county offices. What is the purpose? My perspective is the purpose of data is pretty much to do the following, and I'm talking more specifically K through 12, but in schools in general. It's to provide a degree of transparency, accountability, and measurability to the public. In many cases, the problems that I have with data are the following. One, who's compiling the information? How is it compiled? How is it disaggregated? And more importantly, how is it represented? Because I spent 18 years in the classroom and I saw many, many cases in which data was represented in a manner that served an agenda or a purpose. It did not serve a useful purpose for me in my instructional and educational environment. In addition to that, we turn data into this measurable component to all of these different things that I think and that my whole purpose of this time that I have with you, it takes out the human element. Okay, and I'll share a story with all of you later. We become so obsessed with providing a numerical measurement for everything that in many cases is taking us what I call off track. So I want to ask all of you a question for you to just ponder for, for a moment. What brought you into education? What was your motivation for, for working in education? What was your schooling experience like? And more importantly, how did data influence any components of that? And I'm going to guess that you didn't think or you didn't look at it and say, okay, my GPA is 3.5, so therefore I can apply to these 10 schools and I have a 75% chance of getting into five of them, and then this school is a 100% chance that I will go through and graduate. We don't think about it that way. We think about what kind of experience do I want to have based on the uh, accessibility and, and options that I have within that particular context. And more importantly, when data is used, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll point out some on the slide, when data is used in that manner, again, what, what I, I like to say is it gets us off track, and I'll show you in just a moment, but let me go back for one second. That was my favorite one right there, data-driven instruction. I can't tell you how many years I was hammered into me as a teacher when I was in my teacher prep program, even a master's program. One that was mentioned earlier about Bloom's taxonomy, which I don't have enough time to get into all that, but I'm glad that John mentioned that comment, but data-driven instruction. And the question I used to always ask is a couple of things. One, are we instructing students or are we educating students? Because those are two very different things. And number two, how can I take numerical measurement and apply that to something that involves a human element? And you can't, you shouldn't. And so therefore, what I want to get into is share with all of you a little quick story. So in the time that I worked in the classroom, I worked with a number of students that had significant challenges, whether it was their social economic background, what their zip code was, or anything like that. And I'm glad yesterday that both Pedro and Jim mentioned the fact that that is one element that oftentimes is, is conveniently ignored when it comes to the achievement of students and the performance of schools. I had several students, in one case I will share with you all in particular, the data said the following, that student was performing below grade level, average GPA for that student up until the point I had them was about 1.1, student hated school, of course school was what, what do most students say about school? Boring. What I say is this because it's predictable, and that student was either going to be as a young adult, unemployed or incarcerated. The difference is, 
my core belief as an educator is building the meaningful relationships with students to the point now where not only did I get to know that student, just like what Pedro shared yesterday as far as getting to know our students, not only did I get to know that student, that student today graduated from college, has his own monetized YouTube channel, which I'll mention YouTube in just a moment, and produces music videos for up and coming artists here in Los Angeles. Now here's another thing about the data that is conveniently used, and I mentioned this in a conversation I had yesterday. Why is YouTube consistently blocked in so many schools and school districts across the country? Yet, here's some data for you. Did you all know that every 60 seconds, there's 300 hours of content uploaded to YouTube? In one 24-hour time period, there is more content uploaded to YouTube than the entire history of television. When you ask a child, where are you gonna go to learn something? First question is usually, I'm going to Google that. And by the way, do you all know that none of you have a student now that was born BG, which is before Google? Okay? Which leads me to a whole different question I would ask, which I always ask teachers I have the opportunity to work with is, number one, whatever you do in your, in your learning environment, do not ask students Googleable questions. Okay? That's number one. Now going back to the YouTube example. Why is it blocked when yet that's where most students go? By the way, you all know most students today think that Facebook is for old folks, by the way, okay? So if that's where they go, that's where you can go literally to learn anything right now. And in the case of that example I shared with you, a former student, he's using YouTube, not just a publication platform, but his channel is monetized, which means he's making money off of it, okay? Why are we not providing that data to schools to be used for the opportunity for our students to be able to, one, have a platform for amplification of their voice, publication of their work, and ideally connections and collaboration across, across literally across geographical boundaries that exist, okay? So that's my main point with the data, is looking at what can we do with data to provide not only students the right environment for their learning, but more importantly, not taking away the human element, because in the end, the most important thing is what's in your mind and what's in your hearts and what brought you to education. I don't care what the numbers say. What I care is what does that individual say and how does your relationship with that individual impact the future that they have ahead of them? Thank you.